welcome. Today we are going to address by far one of my favorite philosophers, the 19th century melancholy Dane, Soren Kierkegaard, the father of existentialism. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit about his life as well as one of the other readings that we are not focusing on the class, which really kind of helps us understand a little bit about the notions of what is existentialism as Soren Kierkegaard viewed it himself. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and break into our actual readings for the day. As I just mentioned, Kierkegaard is the father of existentialism. Thus, what you think about existentialism and existentialist philosophy moving forward uh, may or may not always line up with what the father of the actual intellectual movement did and thought of it. When you hear existentialist philosophy, what are your initial impressions? Where are you gonna move forward with that? Some of you believe it's overly complicated. Uh, that it gets way too difficult, has a lot of fancy extra terminology. And to be fair, there's some element of truth in that, although some of the terminology you're familiar with is not intrinsic to all existentialists, but a certain subset of existentialists, maybe 19th century existentialists, maybe 20th century existentialists, maybe theistic existentialists, maybe atheist ex existentialists. And many of them will have different language and different complicated maybe even overly complicated systems to address that. Some of you think of it as very cold and rationalistic, uh, that it's just, you know, dark and dreary and, and kind of lives either in, in Russia and in the Soviet Union or somehow in Eastern Europe or kind of dank, rational, life is almost all over sort of schools. And, and this might be true for some, but we probably wouldn't think of it as that. Similarly, others of you might think of it as lively and energetic from that same basic idea of where it's come from. You're thinking about the exuberance of thinking about things that really matter and discussing all of that and the enthusiasm that gets there. Still, most of you probably think of existentialism like some other entry-level notions of philosophy as a school of thought, then it might just be somewhat difficult to understand, and this would be appropriate as well. Kierkegaard is a great model of theistic existentialism, as opposed to atheistic existentialism. In some ways, people look at this as an early versus modern, different interpretations of existentialism, of the whole God question or not. Kierkegaard on one side, and we also have Dostoevsky, who's also usually tied in with notions of theistic existentialism. Uh, but again, we're going to kind of look at this a little bit different. At, at the very heart of theistic existentialism is not actually just the God question, but the focus on your existence as the individual and you as the agent whose choices determines your essence. And for the theistic existentialist, you must align your existence with your essence, which is pre-known and pre-formed by God. And therefore, your actions must line up to what is known in a greater response of who you are. Practically, looking at the life of the man Soren Kierkegaard, there are many different things that we could say about him. He was born in 1813 and would die in 1855, a fairly relatively short life. Lived in Denmark, therefore obscure by the realms of most of our other philosophers that take place in France and Germany and England, the intellectual powerhouses of modern Europe or ancient Greece uh, or elsewhere where there's centers of power and texts circulating all around you. He is a father of a movement uh, although never thought of himself as such. He would also pen thousands of words to convince readers that you cannot convince intellectually about Christianity. And he believed that it was his job to make Christianity harder, that this is something that you needed to internalize and make in your life. As such, he's often referred to as the melancholy Dane. Of the four major events that shape Soren Kierkegaard's life, the first is often referred to as the earthquake and in fact might even take place before Soren Kierkegaard was born. You see here an image on the left of his father, uh, and it said that his father grew up very, very poor. 
and at what point his father Michael will curse God for his poverty. This becomes part of the earthquake, not just because he was poor, but after cursing God for his poverty, he became tremendously rich. So this ends up having this sort of big, sort of odd moment. Uh, so Soren Kierkegaard's father became wealthy uh, as also Denmark was becoming more poor. In fact, great fires ram it, ravaged through all of Denmark and his father's family emerged from that. Later, his brother Peter will go off and who you see to the right become a parson and kind of move past this event. But for Soren, who was born the very same year that the Danish state became bankrupt, this cursing of God was seen as a household curse that they all had to live under and live with their wealth. In fact, the earthquake even extended so much that Soren was told growing up that his inheritance would last just as long as he would, uh, and that Michael also thought all of his children would die before he did. He saw many of his children die, except for Peter and Soren, who will outlive him. But this sort of idea of this dread always hanging over your head because you cursed God and, and yet got somewhat rewarded for it, really kind of changed the way that he was going to approach his own life uh, and everyone moving along those lines. The next major event is known as the Corsair Affair. Uh, here the Corsair is kind of like a National Lampoon, Weekly World News, Star, Gossip Times sort of magazine that existed during Denmark at the time. Uh, and it was, you know, be important to show that you're important if you're getting lampooned a little bit in it. And this is kind of what's going to happen. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard had already entered into Danish society at this point. He was already a social critic, having criticized Hans Christian Andersen, uh, who he was somewhat friends with. Uh, Andersen was able to kind of rebuff this criticism uh, very easily. Uh, but Kierkegaard kind of was in there and in that mix, but uneasy with some of this. He ended up kind of getting a review of one of his works that he thought came out way too soon. He believed that the author didn't even have time to read it, and therefore it was more just a caricature and not a real analysis of his literary work and of his thoughts. So Kierkegaard did what Kierkegaard does, which was use his quick wit, something that he was known for as a child. Uh, in fact, he even earned the nickname in school as the Fork, in part because he would be able to pin down his opponents, although his household kind of called him this because he would grab up the food before other people did. Uh, but this becomes kind of a nickname that he's got. Uh, and so he unmasks one of the pseudonyms of the author who wrote a review of his work. Kierkegaard thought you didn't have time to do it and therefore I'm going to you know, publicly shame you. Uh, the Corsair ended up kind of becoming a little bit overreactionary and it ends up kind of attacking uh, in very vicious cycle Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, and this ends up becoming just widely known as the greatest literary debacle in 19th century Denmark. And it becomes one of those pivotal events in Kierkegaard's life, as well as the publication itself. The publication tries to backwater and eventually uh, just folds. It's not able to kind of survive this affair. Kierkegaard kind of falls into a state of depression, but emerges. But his name becomes a source of derision. Soren, which was one of the more popular names in Denmark, uh, if you actually follow the, the birth records, almost vanishes off of the list of names because nobody wants to name their child Soren in light of the debacle of what happened on the Corsair. Uh, so it's an interesting sort of idea that the name goes from one of the more popular ones to just, you know, obscurity within his own lifetime. Uh, and this is the sort of trauma that it has. We also get these interesting depictions, these characters, these cartoons of Kierkegaard during the Corsair affair. 
If ever you see these images of Kierkegaard where he's kind of tall and gangly, or his face kind of looks off, uh, or his teeth almost look like they're too big for his mouth and his nose is too pointy, and oftentimes he'll have kind of a hutched or, or crooked back, these are the drawings that came out of the whole Corsair affair as well. You have this sort of interesting idea where sometimes you've got Kierkegaard where he's kind of dashing looking and other times you've got one there you kind of go, Err, right? Those errant ones kind of grew out of this affair as well and also become part of the lasting legacy of this. And again, the magazine will fold, the editor and publisher will kind of have to just kind of leave town for a while. Uh, and Soren Kierkegaard will eventually get his footing back and realized that he had gone too far with his critique. Uh, and this, of course, can happen to everybody. The next major event in Kierkegaard's life was actually an event that happened in Denmark. It didn't happen directly to him. And this was the Revolution of 1848. This, by the way, is the only real revolution that stuck in all of Europe. The king would lose his powers and establish a new constitution, which will in somewhat ways disestablish the Lutheran Church and also establish the Lutheran Church in a different sort of way in Denmark. It establishes what becomes known as the People's Church, where to become a Danish Christian was the same to be a Danish citizen. Kierkegaard thought this was an alarming thing, as the way he saw his job was to make Christianity more difficult. And now the revolution not only has eliminated the monarchy, uh, view of government that Kierkegaard thought was the best, uh, according to other ones of his writings, where he simply says, of all forms of government, monarchy is the best, and now it is weakened. But it also then makes Christianity effortless, easy, and unimportant in Kierkegaard's understanding. Uh, he would refer to the members of Denmark then as geese, and while most of us kind of don't really think much about this insult. Geese do two things. They are loud anywhere they show up. And they also leave a lot of crap wherever they leave. They're noisy and destructive. And this is really what he sees happening in Denmark as a result of the revolution of 1848 and the mobs that emerge with this. He believed that the Christianity of the New Testament could never be synonymous with an organization that would make compromises with other institutions. And now the church in Denmark was doing that. He strongly disagreed with a notion that was growing in popularity of vox populi, vox dei, right? The voice of the populace or the voice of the people is the voice of God. And he thought that this was just an atrocity. And he believed that the revolution was a horrible thing and this would bring on his attack upon christendom which is not christianity but the establishment of this sort of national identity as a christian the fourth event that would mark kierkegaard in his life was his engagement to regine olsen who lived 1822 to 1904 she outlived kierkegaard significantly he fell madly in love with her, really kind of at second sight. His first sight, he kind of liked her, and the second one, he's like, okay, I want to marry you. Um, and eventually, he will move over and propose and be engaged to her. But Kierkegaard discovered very quickly that an engagement is easy to make, but not easy to keep. Once he proposed and envisioned having a happy life with the woman that he madly loved, he realized that he couldn't be married to her. While they shared religious perspectives, both of which grew up in Moravian or pietist households, uh, she was of equal or possibly even greater social standing than him. He found her physically attractive. There was no problem with any of that. Uh, and he'll talk about her beauty. Um, and he also did find her a good muse for his work. Uh, many of his works are dedicated to her, even after the broken off engagement. But he realized that he was put on this earth for work, that this becomes his job, this is his task, and this is what he must do. He realized that either he could be a good husband and neglect his work, or 
he can neglect his uh, he can neglect his wife and continue to do his work and therefore be a bad husband. He didn't see any sort of middle ground between the two, and so Kierkegaard will engage the rest of his life in work and break off his engagement to Regine Olson. Of course, he knows that this would cause great scandal because generally speaking, if you're breaking off an engagement in 19th century Europe and Denmark as well, it was believed that the woman had done something wrong. Uh, and Kierkegaard loved Regine or Regina, depending on translations, uh, on so much that he didn't want to scandalize her. And so he acted crazy in public for months, uh, or at least long enough to, to get everyone to think, okay, he's insane and she should break off the engagement and that would be okay and not cause scandal. And it left her with her honor intact and would allow her to marry another. And so this is exactly what he did. Kierkegaard acted crazy, she broke off the work and was able to marry and he could dedicate his life now to his work. Kierkegaard will spend the rest of his life writing profusely. Uh, actually, there's a few different breaks in his authorship that he will have just moments where he stops and writes his uh, no more and then pick up and write again. Uh, and usually there's some sort of massive change that happens to correspond with some of these uh, the loss or death of a friend, uh, or the events of the world around him, or those one of those four major events that we talked about, dividing it in there. You can kind of see some of his major works here, uh, either or probably being his biggest and most known for. He'll have a series of what becomes known as edifying or upbuilding discourses, uh, which are in some ways his way of trying to be uh, a parson, a priest, a pastor, because he really was called to try to do this as well. And he would try to kind of encourage others in, in the life that are maybe just kind of more pastoral in his ways. Um, he'll, you know, see several different lists of those. He'll have other sorts of writings that are just different from one another. They become experiments in thought uh, or in action. And oftentimes these will be kind of paired together in different works as well. What's really neat about Kierkegaard and his authorship is not just that he's got different periods where he kind of has different tones or expectations, but that he'll actually have a lot of these different tones coinciding with other events where he's writing things that are almost entirely different or from a different approach. And I don't mean that he's going to talk, you know, when it's romance novels or sports or, or anything else along those lines, but he does have those upbuilding discourses. He'll also have other works that are written not by him, though they're by him, but by pseudonyms. Uh, most of the time, people will have pseudonyms and they will use this to hide their identity. Uh, this becomes very much a, a literary fashion where people will try to hide who they are and then kind of just leave it there and then maybe, you know, maybe comment about it in the day or something else. But it, it's for a handful of reasons people want to hide their identity. Sometimes this was because they were a woman uh, or Jewish uh, in different groups and, and you wouldn't want to do that uh, because it wouldn't allow you to be published with different sort of social conventions. Kierkegaard didn't care. In fact, he would even write that he was the editor of these works uh, and he wasn't trying to hide his identity at all. But he would have different characters who would have different sorts of impulses, desires, points of views, perspectives some of whom he thought were fervent Christians, some of whom were not, uh, some of which were trying to be this sort of character and some who were that. Really the idea for Kierkegaard is that he wanted to have a different sort of authorship, a different sort of writing where he'll say, I didn't write that. I mean, we all know I wrote that, but I didn't write that. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of that character who I had write that book. In some way we almost see like, multiple personality disorder where they're all fighting to get out their voices but it wasn't even that because he would organize it and know it all over the place either or was written or at least edited by victor uh, aramita repetition uh, is written by 
constant constius, which is fantastic because right, it's repeating itself and yet it's constantly repeating is kind of the name that he gets. Fear and Trembling is written by John the Silent, Johannes de Silencio. Uh, and here the kind of the idea of being the silent observer is throughout that work. Philosophical Fragments, which we'll get to later, uh, is written by Johannes Climacus, the name of a Christian monk, John of the Ladder. Uh, later on, at the end of his writing, he'll have things, uh, his authorship, things like Sickness Unto Death and Practice of Christianity, are written by anti-Climacus. Anti, not meaning opposed, but after or later. And so we can kind of see this sort of transition there. Concept of anxiety is uh, Vigilantis Huffness, right, the, the Vigilant Observer. Prefaces, Nicholas Nodoby. Uh, we have Stages on Life Lie by a hilarious bookbinder, uh, right? So we have others, Inter et Inter, uh, or HH, which just means the Copenhagen, or uh, as this was the symbol and identity of the town. So we have these different sorts of authorship with different sort of meanings to try to present different perspectives. He would also have different ones that are, you know, edited by somebody else by s kierkegaard and in many ways even s kierkegaard is a pseudonym uh, where is kierkegaard in all of his works becomes a little bit more difficult and you kind of have to become a big kierkegaard scholar to fully understand when can we say kierkegaard is saying this and when didn't he he kept also a journal on top of all these other major works uh, and would comment with other people out in the social world. Uh, it said that he had dozens of writing desks in his house, that he would stop whenever he had an idea and start writing it down. Th th this might be an exaggeration, maybe not. He did spend a lot of money on different luxuries like this as well. Uh, so we have all of these sorts of different interesting ways that he would approach the idea of his work. Since this is what he believed that he was put here on earth to do, he didn't waste his time in doing it. And really, Kierkegaard couldn't waste much time. He didn't live a very long life. If we end up, you know, adding up the numbers, he died relatively young, uh, when we might expect a lot more. It's odd that he was relatively broke the same time he died. Uh, so he kind of had this idea from his father that he wouldn't live out, outlive his money. And he did a lot of spending and, and didn't leave a lot left, uh, even though some of the works were bringing in money. Uh, during his death, at one point, it is said that he just kind of fell down in the street from a sort of illness. This happened on October 2nd of 1855. He was unconscious in the street, having a paralysis in his legs. He was then taken to Frederick's hospital where he'll spend the next 40 days with some sort of ailment of the spine, uh, although the exact answer is, is a little bit unknown. His brother wanted to enter and see him, but because his brother was a part of the church, was a bishop, he rejected his brother, believing his brother to be a functionary and not a true Christian in this respect. He would allow his friend, uh, a pastor Borson, to visit him daily, uh, but when urged to have communion before he died, Kierkegaard rejected it, uh, not because he rejected communion, and as a good Lutheran, he would have looked forward to this as being essential for him, but he was asked if he wanted communion. He said, yes, but not from a person. He was willing to die without communion, believing that persons are only royal functionaries and that they are not related to Christianity and that he will receive true communion with God once he has passed. Uh, and so he's kind of going out on that message that he had about trying to make life hard uh, and the sacrament would bring him comfort and make his life easier. But he wanted to have real communion, not denying the real presence of the Eucharist, of course, but he wanted to have difficult communion with his God. He wanted to earnestly throw himself upon God's uh, mercies and move forward within all of that. The 26 volumes of his work, the 29 different books of all of these things, uh, were all there and are all important, uh, but is about to encounter God 
and he wanted to be there with God, having done what he was called and put here to do. In many ways, we have a very similar sort of parallel to Aquinas in his life, that Aquinas wanted the communion instead of the work, and Kierkegaard wanted the ecstasy that Aquinas had with communion, and thought he could only do that if he dived himself into his work. Uh, right, so this is its own sort of fun discussion that can take place. In the work Fear and Trembling, we see this interesting sort of discussion. It opens up a story uh, by Johannes de Silencio, uh, right, that it is John the Silent, who is the silent observer into this event, that we should approach these ideas with fear and trembling, being quiet is where the title is going to come from. It's not of the story of Abraham, but of a man who wants to understand what it would have been like for Abraham. For Abraham with, you know, the being called by God to execute his son. Ultimately, the story of Abraham became one where the man wanted nothing more than to see how Abraham wrestled with God and what God called him to do in the story of what's commonly referred to as the binding of Isaac. So what's really interesting here is that Kierkegaard is shifting the story from the binding of Isaac, where it's really more about Isaac, and he's looking at what he identifies as the anguish of Abraham. And others will kind of quote him and move on in that direction. Traditionally speaking, this is the event that Isaac gets to show that he is a patriarch, that he's willing to die for God. It's not as much about Abraham as it is about his son. For Kierkegaard, he's looking at how does a man make an impossible decision? And if you're kind of reading between the two lines here, you're going to see that this is not really about Abraham and Isaac as much as it is about Kierkegaard and the love of his life for Gene Olson. How is it that you can make an impossible decision where God is calling you to give up what you love most? How do you do that? And how do you remain true to your God and true to the woman or person that you love? This is really the subtext of all this, and we really get to see a fun sort of example of existentialism, where it's all about the choices and decisions we make, and that that shapes our identity and how we are to move forward. But obedience becomes kind of essential and almost expected. And so in this sort of retelling, Johannes de Silencio is presenting four different versions of what he thinks might have been able to be the case when Abraham was called to give up the object of his love, his son. In the first version, God called Abraham to sacrifice his son, and Kierkegaard tells us that the ride was long and silent. Isaac was not able to understand his father's prayers. Then he saw his father going to kill him. And when Isaac saw Abraham's face, it was changed. His glance was wild, uh, his form was horror. He seized Isaac by the throat and threw him to the ground and said, Stupid boy, dost thou then suppose that I am thy father? I am an idolater. Dost thou suppose that this is God's bidding? No, it is my desire. Abraham's cry is then to God. It is better for him to believe that I'm a monster rather than he should lose his faith in thee. He then pairs this sort of interesting story with different ways that mothers must reject their child, uh, that they must be weaned off of the breast. It says the same must be done here, that the mother might blacken her breast so the child rejects the breast, but not his mother. That this is the sort of call of what's going to be done. How is it that you do this? You don't want the child to reject the mother, so you blacken the breast so the child rejects the breast. Abraham doesn't want Isaac to reject God, so he makes himself the demon. He changes his face and not that of his God. He says, no, I'm the idolater. Does Abraham tell uh, Isaac, I did it? Now hate, you know, hate God too? No, not in this version. Does Soren say to Regine, God told me I have to leave you. Sorry, 
No, because then she will regret God, not just the man she was engaged to. The second version of the story uh, continues that Abraham prepared to do what God had called him to do, but simply could not. Therefore, he could not forget that God required this of him. And Isaac throve as ever before, but Abraham's eyes were darkened, and he knew new more joy. If by chance Abraham just wants to say, no, God, I can't do it, what you're requesting is too much, this is too difficult, then Abraham won't know God. Isaac can be as before, but he won't have any real joy in his life just as Soren couldn't have any joy in his life if he was to be married, uh, even though Regine might not know any difference. Probably she would figure it out. But this is the sort of fear and thought that's going to be there. Again, when a child must be weaned, uh, it has to grow big and be weaned. The mother virginally hides her breast, so the child has no more mother. Happy is the child who did not uh, another way lose his mother by just hiding it away, by rejecting it. It never exists, uh, doesn't always solve the problem either. The third version proceeds that Abraham thought the sacrifice that he already did, recalling back Hagar and Ishmael, putting them out, and was unable to do it, but cried out to God to forgive his sin, not in his inability to sacrifice his son, but that he would even consider it. After all, it is his duty of a father to protect his child. Right here, I'm already engaged. I already owe Regine something, legally, contractually, religiously, emotionally, socially, all of these things. I have certain obligations. How dare I reject my obligations? Right, Looking back at already what I have given, right? there, there becomes a sort of self-justification and not true humility within this respect. And therefore, it's not really being dutiful, and you're not really following through with what God requires, according to Kierkegaard or Johannes de Silencio here. Here, the mother is also so sorrowful that when a child must be weaned, that they mourn the loss of that aspect of their relationship together, that both are putting this away and mourning this loss. And maybe he can mention at least of what he's being called to or expected to do at this moment. In the fourth and final version of the story, Abraham did what God called him to do. And the relationship between the father and the son was therefore ruined. He held out the knife and said, God told me to do this and, and ended up having this fight. Isaac had lost his faith and Isaac never talked to anyone about what he had seen. But Abraham did not suspect that anyone had seen it. It becomes this sort of, I'm having to do it, and this relationship is broken now. Maybe even the relationship between you and God, but at least I did it, and I'm you know, not happy about it, and you're not happy about it either. Um, and here, when the child is weaned, he says that the child is weaned from the breast by eating other food. Right? That you happy... You need to give somebody something else. You need to give somebody, the child, the food and the readiness. You need to provide something new. And this is really what he's going to say is what Abraham had to do. Abraham had to explain to Isaac, not only are you losing out, but you're going to be gaining something as a result. There's going to be some benefit uh, to this loss. It's not just that I hate you and despise you or that God does, but that this is for life. Right, that this might be a resurrection or, or a miracle or, or something. Therefore, the same with the child who now has food rejected. There should be something else, right? new solid foods that take the place, uh, that a new life opens up within all of this. And Kierkegaard is, is trying to say that this is really what he needs to make sure to keep in mind uh, as well, that he's not simply rejecting Regina, but that he's providing her something. Uh, a happy life with somebody who can spend all of his time with them. Now, again, he's still madly in love with her. He still gave her all of his royalties, etc. I'll go down her family line. And everyone knows the two of them and, and not so much her f future husband. But this is the thought that this needs to be provided in this love story. 
this this work ends with you know Abraham Abraham who is capable of understanding him what does he demonstrate for us what does he show us the idea is that in every decision that is before us we must choose and the choice we must face the consequences and there will be consequences that is what's absolutely important for existentialism as Kierkegaard sees it you're not making a choice to avoid consequences this isn't just to make your life easier in fact oftentimes the consequences will be hard but this is what we are called to do uh, this is the challenge even in how we respond we can alter the relationships we have with other people this is a difficult task trying to conform our wills to what God sees in ourself, but this is what's called for by the theistic existentialist. Even when the task before us is an impossible one for us to do, we are still called to do the impossible. Kierkegaard will end up saying he did it by giving up the love of his life, that Abraham will offer his son. All of us have challenges, big ones that we need to do impossible things for, but we all need to do that. Most of us, by the way, are not going to be called to make such extreme decisions. Uh, but this is why it requires a leap of faith to accept all of this for Kierkegaard, uh, and that this is the push, that we must reject the temptations or passions which seek to make our life easy, as opposed to making the deliberate decisions to conform our wills a difficult decision. Right, And so this becomes a very important thing for existentialism here, right? Every decision has to be weighed out. How much time do you spend in your day-to-day -day life thinking about the ramifications of each of the possible outcomes of your decision, of the different ways that you can approach a difficult task? Do you have one way? Do you have four ways? Do you just do it? Right. The weight of all of these things and controlling your life is what we really are called to do according to Kierkegaard and this is kind of the broader aspect of what, what he sees the job of his philosophy to do his writings and what we are going to be reading and discussing as time goes by so today we talked about the life and one of the works of Soren Kierkegaard we're about to go into and read a little bit more uh, philosophical fragments and kind of go through that in discussing. Uh, but really the idea here for Kierkegaard, his underlining philosophy, is that we need to care about our choices, uh, that each of our decisions that we make make us who we are, and that everything we do needs to grow out of that and conform to what at least we think it should be. This is going to be radically different than people like Satra, who we'll get to at the end of the semester, atheist existentialists, who, while emphasizing choices and decisions, do so for a very different sort of reason. And so this becomes existentialism. This is Kierkegaard. I would have loved to go on. Uh, I wrote part of my dissertation on Kierkegaard and have given several different conferences, papers on Kierkegaard and could you know, give you some more of those examples as time goes by, if in need you desire that. Um, but again, we have different limits and time constraints. And I want to make sure that we have enough time to introduce philosophical fragments uh, and not just kind of geek out on different aspects of Kierkegaard and his work. So if you have any uh, other questions, again, feel free to email and discuss. Uh, talk about different decisions that you guys have to make. Uh, and how it is that you approach decisions. Is this easy? Is this hard? Uh, or some other aspect of these different readings. Thank you.